Welcome to the Alliance for Eye and Vision Research's annual World Glaucoma Week Congressional Briefing. Uh, I'm Dan Ignazewski, and I'm the Executive Director for the Alliance for Eye and Vision Research, uh, or AVER, uh, which is a 501c3 nonprofit foundation that educates about the value of eye and vision research and serves as the primary, as the privately funded Friends of the National Eye Institute, or NEI. Begin. I want to take care of a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, you'll notice that during this Zoom briefing, that only speakers will have the ability to turn on their videos and communicate verbally throughout the presentations. Um, if you have questions about glaucoma or if you have any questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can use the chat box throughout the presentation as well if you have other questions uh, or need additional information. Um, and at the very end of the, uh, the presentations, we are going to have a uh, opportunity for Q&A. So uh, please, throughout the presentations, if you have questions that, that arise, uh, please submit them. Uh, we'll make sure to address them at the end of the presentation. Uh, I also do want to confirm that this is being recorded and will be available uh, on the ARPO YouTube channel, as well as on the AVER website. Uh, if you go to www.iresearch.org, uh, that will be available in the next few days. Um, so we're looking forward to, to doing the presentation. And again, if you have any questions or need any additional information, uh, please use the Q&A box for question or the chat for any uh, follow up. Now that we have uh, the logistics covered, uh, let's move on with the program. Uh, so the Alliance for Eye and Vision Research's mission is to ensure the best vision care for all Americans through education of congressional legislators, government policymakers, coalition partners, the media, and consumers about the value of eye and vision research. Uh, AVER also serves as the privately funded Friends of NEI uh, and launched its research saving site, Restoring Vision Initiative, in 2021. Today's event is AVER's first research saving site, Restoring Vision Initiative event of 2022. Uh, the Research Saving Site Restoring Vision Initiative is a sustained activity that is uh, aimed to ed educating uh, about the enormous strides the National Eye Institute uh, and funded research has made in terms of new approaches to diagnostics, interventions, uh, therapies, and for eye and vision care as a whole that lead to improved outcomes for patients. It also highlights the tools and the supports uh, that are needed for these new approaches, such as imaging, uh, big data, and artificial intelligence. Today's briefing is supported by several major vision organizations and companies, uh, and I'd like to thank each of them for helping make today's briefing possible. Uh, this includes uh, Research to Prevent Blindness, uh, the American Glaucoma Society, uh, the Glaucoma Research Foundation, and the Optometric Glaucoma Society. I also want to extend thanks to the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology, ARVO, uh, who's helping provide our streaming support for today's event. Uh, and Glaucos uh, for providing event support for uh, today's session and today's briefing. So a little bit about glaucoma uh, and a little bit about uh, World Glaucoma Week. Uh, the first World Glaucoma Day was held in March of 2009 as organizations worldwide hold events to educate about this blinding eye disease. This is AVER's 14th annual glaucoma event and we look forward to continuing World Glaucoma Week is March 6th through 12th, so we're right in the middle of it, uh, and it is being celebrated worldwide with organizations putting a spotlight on glaucoma, and AVER is no different. Glaucoma is the second leading cause of preventable vision loss in the United States, affecting 3 million Americans, uh, and AVER is expected to more than double by 2050 without interventions. Each year, AVER's Glaucoma Briefing features leaders and experts in glaucoma clinical Research, clinical practice, and uh, this year is no exception. We're pleased to feature leaders in glaucoma research and care and uh, identify some unique patient perspectives. This, uh, this briefing is highlighted by uh, some great speakers, including Dr. Leon Herndon, uh, who's a professor of ophthalmology at Duke University Medical Center. Dr. Herndon has authored over 100 articles and currently serves as chief of the glaucoma division at Duke University Eye Center. He will provide a background on glaucoma diagnosis, interventions and therapies, health disparities in glaucoma, and some challenges experienced during the COVID pandemic. Followed by Dr. Herndon, we have uh, Thomas Brunner, who serves as president and CEO of the Glaucoma Research Foundation. Uh, and he will share a little bit more information about the foundation, the need for research, and the positive impact that research has on patient outcomes. Last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Dr. Trin Green, 
who is a practicing physician in the San Francisco Bay Area, who will provide her unique perspective as not only a practicing physician, but also as a patient who was diagnosed with glaucoma at the age of 21. Again, I thank you all for participating in today's briefing. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Herman. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dan, for the introduction. Uh, say happy World Glaucoma Week uh, to everyone. It's an honor for me to be able to share in this program. And I really uh, look forward to the interchange uh, that we'll have uh, this afternoon. The title of my talk is Inequity in Glaucoma Services Cost Site. But we'll start out with some of the basics, as Dan sort of alluded to. There are over 3 million Americans who have glaucoma. 120,000 Americans are blind due to glaucoma. And glaucoma is the second leading cause of blindness worldwide, making up about 15% of all cases of blindness. There is a racial disparity where glaucoma primary open and glaucoma is known to have a prevalence of six, eight times higher among African Americans who are at a much greater likelihood of blindness. Some of the basics, uh, when we look at glaucoma, when we look at the anatomy of the eye, a simple definition of glaucoma could be that this is an illness of the optic nerve and the nerve uh, carries electrical signals for sight from the retina to the brain. And there is a nutrient called aqueous fluid that uh, constantly turn over in the front part of the eye. And this eye pressure depends on the amount of this clear nourishing fluid that is transferred into the eye to inflate it and to feed the lens and the cornea, uh, which have no blood vessels to feed them. So there's something about glaucoma where there's some interruption of this outflow of this clear fluid, the aqueous fluid out of the drain. And when the pressure elevates, it causes damage to the delicate optic nerve uh, in the back of the eye. And I want to thank Mona Kaleem uh, from Wilmer, who gave a, a lecture last year at this program, and she uh, shared some of these slides with me. But this gives you an idea when we're looking in the back of the eye, what a healthy optic nerve looks like uh, on your screen, uh, on the right side of your screen, you can see the optic nerve it looks like a donut. There's a center part of the, of the donut we call a cup. So this cup in the left eye is normal. Uh, we like to put a dimension to it. Uh, it's about a 25% we call cup to disc ratio 0.25. So this cup makes up about 25% of the old whole nerve as opposed to the right uh, patient's uh, eye or in your screen, your left side. This has a much larger hole in the donut, if you will, a much larger cup because there's been damage, there's been loss of nerve fibers over time due to the advanced uh, elevated eye pressure and that leads to visual field loss. This is an example of what one a patient's visual field in uh, her left eye uh, looked like over time from year one to year four. You see a year one, she had a normal visual field test. We all have a normal blind spot in our visual fields. But over time with the ILP too high, you see how she develops more and more visual field loss uh, to the point she gets uh, defects in her central vision that are really starting to affect uh, her, her quality of life. And the thing that I like to emphasize is that these changes are permanent. So once you start losing visual field, we can't give that back to you. So it's so important to intervene early to prevent further vision loss. So these are some consequences of glaucoma, uh, loss of visual field, as I share with you, causing blind spots. One thing we don't talk a whole lot about is loss of contrast sensitivity. I've got patients of mine who always, many of whom complain of having trouble adjusting from light to dark and from dark to light. And this is a uh, contrast sensitivity chart. So believe it or not, there are eight rows of letters here. I'm not sure if it, many of you can read the very bottom <laughs> of the bottom row. But glaucoma patients have a lot of trouble getting down two or three uh, lines uh, because uh, they, they just need a lot more contrast with their day-to-day -day function. Uh, I don't have to tell this audience that many Americans rate losing eyesight as having the greatest impact in daily life. So this is a, a survey 
and there's a scale from one to 10 where when is having the least impact and 10 having the greatest impact on your daily life. And how would you rate losing your eyesight? And this is broken down by different racial groups. And you can see it range from 38% to 57% of patients or respondents who felt that losing their eyesight would have the greatest impact on their daily life. Another way of looking at that is when you compare loss of sight to other uh, ailments that we all would be concerned about, cancer, HIV, AIDS, Alzheimer's. And you see that from 15 to 20% of these respondents felt that losing their sight uh, would be uh, among the, the, the worst things that could happen to them, uh, worse in many cases in cancer or Alzheimer's. So let me give you a little background about, this is an, an audio. I, I go to West Africa, or I have been going for several years, and I met this patient, uh, Willie. He's okay if we share his name. In the late 1990s, when I was doing research there, research project, and I met uh, Willie, who had severe disease at that time. And I told him that he needed surgery. And so over the past uh, 20 years, he's come to Duke to see me uh, for several surgical procedures in both of his eyes. Um, and we interviewed him a couple of years ago about his experiences. And I think uh, it'd be interesting to hear what he has to say about living with glaucoma. So I hope you can hear this. But there are times when you need somebody's help. Uh, I cannot just get in the car and drive anywhere I want to go. I have to get somebody to drive me. Uh, things like that. And... Uh, that feeling of being dependent and not being independent is not a pleasant one for me at all. At all. Uh, so these are some of the problems, you know. Uh, it's a burden not just for you, but for those around you. Because they have to pause and take care of you. You know, I cannot go to the supermarket and pick this and this and that. I can't. Somebody must do that for me. You know, I, your, your sense of independence and sense of and, and the freedom of mobility and all that stuff is curtailed. And uh, you have to be strong, otherwise you can get depressed. Uh, so you have to find a way to live with it. But it's not a full life, no. It's not a full life anymore. Many of the problems that our glaucoma patients face is the problem with continuing to adhere with their medical therapy. This is one article that found that several patients follow over several years, up to seven years. When you look back and ask them questions about being compliant with their therapy, the studies show that those patients who missed two-thirds of their doses over time had almost four times the greater loss of visual field compared to those who did not miss any, any doses. So this is where the rubber hits the road. This shows us that if patients aren't taking their drops, they're more likely to, to lose vision over time. So this article from a couple of years ago really highlighted uh, alternatives to drops. And most of these alternatives are in uh, several various stages of, of research. But I do want to highlight one uh, new sustained delivery system, Bimatapro sustained release that is available now, was approved by the FDA over a year ago. And it's one in a very long line of different options that we hope to have available for our patients in the near future to help them to be more compliant with therapy. And this little cartoon shows you what a Bimatapro sustained release implant will look. We, we implant this in the patient's eye in clinic. And as you see at the bottom of the eye, this little pellet will reside. And over time, over several months, it will release medication into the eye and allow the eye pressure to lower without the patient having to, to take uh, drops, really decreases the patient's medication burden. Um, and, and this is uh, the first step in the sustained release delivery systems that we hope to have readily available to our patients in the very near future. Medications are an option. Laser treatment uh, has been proven to be very effective, particularly a procedure called selective laser tuberculoplasty, or SLT. Uh, it's been shown to be very effective as even the first-line treatment 
So when we first diagnose glaucoma, we may offer them a laser option. And over the years, there have been several trends of glaucoma from uh, more traditional surgeries, such as glaucoma trabeculectomy surgery or glaucoma tube surgery, to an increased use of long tube shots. Uh, there are two Ahmed and Barvelts that we'd like to utilize. But there's a new field of surgery called microinvasive glaucoma surgery or minimally invasive glaucoma surgery that are ultra safe, safe, and quick procedures, but associated with modest IOP or intraocular pressure lowering. Now, these are two examples. There's an eye stent uh, to your left. You can see the two little stents that are in the drain of the eye. And the larger stent called the hydra stent. Uh, these are performed at the time of cataract surgery. And this is a, a video of um, my performing an eye stent uh, procedure uh, a couple of years ago. Cataract surgery has been performed, and then I uh, find the trabecular meshwork or the drain of the eye, and then we place uh, two stents. And this will allow the aqueous fluid, that clear nourishing fluid that I showed you earlier, to be able to leave the eye to lower the pressure and to uh, alleviate the pressure on the optic nerve. One study that I'm involved with uh, is the eyes of Africa, the genetics of blindness. I mentioned that I've done work in West Africa for several years and I'm happy to be uh, associated with uh, this project. We know that glaucoma is a heavy burden on families of affected individuals. And as a disease, primary open angle glaucoma constitutes the single greatest cause of permanent blindness in Africa. So there are two aims uh, to the study. One is to identify new susceptibility genes for glaucoma in order to lay the foundation for novel therapeutic intervention. We hope that successful completion of this aim will reveal the unique genetic underpinnings of glaucoma in Africa and perhaps suggest new targets for therapeutic intervention. Another aim is to conduct targeted glaucoma screening in Sub-Saharan Africa as an approach to identify glaucoma in early and increase awareness of glaucoma in Sub-Saharan Africa. So for the balance of my talk, we'll we'll discuss inequity in glaucoma service and how that cost sight. And I was uh, had the distinct honor early in my career, the host of late Congressman John Lewis as he received the honorary degree from Duke. As he was a co-sponsor for the glaucoma screening bill, our department had the opportunity to rec recognize his efforts. And Congressman Lewis was very gracious with his time. And it was an honor of a lifetime for me to be able to spend a few moments with this civil rights icon. A word about definitions. Disparity uh, can be defined as a great difference. Equality, the state of being equal, especially in status, rights, and opportunities. And equity is the quality of being fair and impartial. I borrowed this slide from Lisa Cooper, a great uh, health sciences researcher at Johns Hopkins, where the cartoon illustrates the fact that some groups may need a boost to achieve health equity to level the playing field, if you will. In this 2017 Lancet article, uh, Bailey and company used a contemporary and historical perspective to discuss research and interventions that grapple with the implications of what is known as structural racism on health inequities. And structural racism refers to the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through mutually reinforcing systems of housing, education, employment, earnings, benefits, credit, media, healthcare, and criminal justice. In this New York Times opinion piece, Gus Wurzelwerk points out that in 2018, black people died at higher age adjusted rates than white people from nine of the top 15 causes of death. And that, that black people had died at the same age adjusted rate as white people in 2018, they would have avoided 65,000 premature excess deaths. National vital statistics show that for the first half of 2020, the life expectancy has dropped for all groups compared to the previous year. This does not reflect the full burden uh, of the COVID pandemic. The life expectancy for black males dropped three years compared to the previous year. And I obviously have significant personal concern about these findings. I'll quote um, 
Anthony Fauci from uh, a couple of years ago. When you're in the middle of a crisis like we are now with the coronavirus, it really does ultimately shine, shine a very bright light on some of the real weaknesses and foibles in our society. There have been several articles published over the past two years that highlight uh, the concern of COVID and health inequities. In this most recent article, at least Mike and Dan LaRoche point out that the COVID pandemic is stoking a fire that has long been burning and that those who were already at greatest risk for vision loss are in even graver danger. Several organizations and companies quickly made statements denouncing racism last spring um, or two years ago, such as the statement from the American Academy of Ophthalmology, where they committed themselves to building a society of fairness, justice, and opportunity for all. I serve on the executive board of the American Glaucoma Society and um, co-chair of this DEI task force. And we put out a statement recently uh, that states in the bottom line that we finally aspire that all members, whether clinicians, researchers, or trainees, feel welcome and included in our society and safe to speak up and speak out. Lou and Freeman and Collins address racial and ethnic disparities in vision care research. In the last paragraph of the article reads that to tackle the elevated burden of eye diseases facing marginalized communities, we need to promise and fulfill our commitment to increase racial and ethnic inclusion in clinical trials. Without addressing this important issue, we risk perpetuating rather than resolving current health disparities. Progress from investigators and institutions alike will help to alleviate the burden many underserved populations face in ophthalmology and vision care. This article, Current and Future Status of Diversity in Ophthalmology, examines the diversity of ophthalmologists in the workplace. And they examine the uh, proportion of ophthalmologists uh, with direct patient care from 2005 to 2015. And you can see uh, noted at the top that um, over time that males uh, have in the uh, blue bar have slowly gone, gone down, but the proportion of underrepresented minorities are much lower than 10% over this period of time. And we see the same thing in our trainees, the residents who are coming behind us, is that uh, we do see a nice upswing in uh, female ophthalmologists in, the, in their training programs. But again, underrepresented minorities are well under 10%, and we don't see any upswing in, in that uh, group. Same thing with proportions of faculty members in the different programs, ophthalmologists, uh, underrepresented minorities are poorly represented. Fairless et al. Uh, published a paper recently looking at the disparity of representation of underrepresented minorities in ophthalmology programs. These are the faculty members. And you see that ophthalmology resides near the bottom of all disciplines uh, when it comes to percentage of underrepresented minority faculty in clinical departments. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time looking at this article where uh, Angela Elam and her colleagues in, in Michigan looked at uh, large disparities in recent glaucoma care between enrollees and Medicaid and those with commercial health insurance. They looked at newly diagnosed glaucoma patients within 15 months of initial diagnosis and looked at the, the times that these uh, uh, diagnostic tests were uh, utilized, visual fields, fundus photography, or OCT, which is a way that we look at the nerve fiber layer. And they looked at Medicaid patients, and they looked at commercial patients. And relative to Optum, or the commercial group, Medicaid patients um, enrollees with glaucoma are younger. They're more female and more racially diverse than their commercial uh, colleagues. If you look at the probability of these tests uh, within 15 months of diagnosis, and black are the Medicaid uh, patients compared to red or the commercial patients. Uh, I'll show you the last group of bars here, which represents that those patients who received no testing over the 15 month uh, period of time. And Medicaid, almost 15, 50% of patients diagnosed with glaucoma underwent no testing at all compared to about 20% of the uh, optimum patients. 
we're looking at odds ratios with uh, optimum patients being the reference group one. Again, you can see that overall, Medicaid patients receive significantly less testing. For example, compared to optimum patients, Medicaid patients had a 68% decrease odds of receiving a visual field test. When stratified by race, you can see that the disparity in testing is greatest in Blacks in Medicaid compared to optimum. For example, Blacks in Medicaid have a 75% uh, decrease odds of receiving a visual field test than Blacks in optimum. In conclusions, Medicaid patients receive uh, less glaucoma testing of all types than those with commercial health insurance. And disparities are present in all races studied, but most dramatic among Blacks. We feel that health policymakers and eye care providers should explore possible etiologies for these disparities and identify solutions. I'm gonna fast forward just a little bit uh, to this article. And this is an article out of the University of uh, uh, San Francisco General Hospital, where glaucoma patients were matched one-to-one -one with uh, cases versus controls to see how well patients followed up. And they found that Black and Latino patients were found on average to show less consistent follow-up with their visits relative to whites. When I talked to my colleagues who were the authors of this paper, I asked, what, what is the racial makeup of the physicians versus the patients? And there is some uh, discordance. There are many studies that show uh, communication uh, evidence in the racial discordant medical interactions is usually less productive and positive in content and tone than racially concordant uh, interactions. I'll skip ahead to this final point. So this article editorial uh, from a year ago really looks at some of the issues that I've discussed and the call to action involves leaders of ophthalmology, that we must advance into a state of conscious competence to eradicate injustice and disparities in health outcomes. And they felt that greater research support for projects that aim to eliminate racial and ethnic disparities is necessary. One of the calls of action was to encourage discussions about racism and to involve more underrepresented minority faculty in the medical school and residency application selection processes and recognizing diversity efforts and promotion pathway for, uh, for faculty. And I'll leave you with this last slide. Uh, this was a slide taken out of my operating room about a year ago. Uh, this is my whole OR team, residents and fellows who were, and medical students who were with me in the OR that day. And I just turned around and noticed something I've not seen before in my 26 years at Duke. And so inequity in glaucoma indeed costs sight. How hopefully we will have the vision uh, to correct these imbalances. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Herndon. I uh, really appreciate that. That was very informative and, and I think really helpful to help un everybody understand the, the scope and challenges related to uh, glaucoma. Uh, we'll have you come back on in a few minutes here for some Q&A. Uh, but next I want to Runner, who serves as the president and CEO of the Glaucoma Research Foundation, uh, and will share a little bit more information about the foundation and, and the need for research. So, uh, Tom, take it away. Thank you, Dan. And Glaucoma Research Foundation's mission is to cure glaucoma and restore vision through innovative research. Next slide, please. And next. My name is Tom Bruner, and I'm the president and CEO of Glaucoma Research Foundation. It's a pleasure to join this congressional briefing in recognition of Glaucoma Awareness Week. I joined Glaucoma Research Foundation in 2003, almost 20 years ago, after a career in the medical device business developing lasers to treat serious eye diseases like diabetic retinopathy macular degeneration, and glaucoma. Next, please. Glaucoma Research Foundation was founded in San Francisco in 1978 by three glaucoma specialists who wanted to find better ways to treat their patients. They believed research was the answer. 
And today, 44 years later, we have much to show from their vision and still much to do. Research grants from Glaucoma Home Research Foundation funded scientists and doctors who discovered the first genes that cause glaucoma and proved that lowering eye pressure helps to prevent vision loss from glaucoma. Our Catalyst for a Cure collaborative research initiatives have helped to redefine glaucoma as an age-related neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Next slide. Thanks to their innovative research, we are closer than ever to curing glaucoma and restoring vision lost to glaucoma. With an aging population in the US and around the world, we are facing an epidemic of vision loss from glaucoma. Through increased awareness and greater access, screening and early diagnosis and treatment, vision can be saved. And through research, we can cure glaucoma and preserve vision for life. Next. It's now my great honor to introduce Dr. Trin Green, a family practice physician, a glaucoma patient, a friend, who re and Dr. Green received her bachelor's and master's degree from Harvard and went on to receive her medical degree from the University of California, Irvine. Trin was a college student when she was diagnosed at 21 years of age. She has been a wonderful friend and frequent volunteer at Glaucoma Research Foundation. Today, she'll share her perspective as a glaucoma patient dealing with glaucoma for most of her life. May I present Dr. Trin Green. So my name is Trin Green, and I am honored to um, have this opportunity to speak with you. Um, I have, I'm a mother of uh, three kids and a family medicine physician uh, who has been living with glaucoma for the past 26 years. I was uh, first diagnosed with glaucoma at the age of 21, uh, just as I was finishing up college and was headed to medical school. Having no family history of the disease at that time and being quite young, I was just completely floored by the diagnosis. I thought, well, this can't be correct. Um, isn't this a quote unquote old person's disease? Um, it was fortuitous that I was being monitored for a different eye condition that uh, my ophthalmologist saw the changes that were consistent with glaucoma. My eye pressures were going up. Uh, the optic discs in the back of my eyes were showing the abnormalities that Dr. Hurden had talked about earlier. So I remember when I got the diagnosis though, this, this in, intense anxiety set in, um, just all of these thoughts were going through my head. Will I be blind? Uh, how will I take care of myself for the rest of my life? Uh, what kind of career will I have? And I certainly didn't get any comfort from the first glaucoma specialist I had who told me that I'd be blind by the time I turned 50. Um, so needless to say, those early days after the diagnosis, I cried a lot. Um, and my glaucoma course has had many ups and downs over the last 26 years. For the first about seven years, it was actually quite easy. I didn't have any discernible vision loss. And all I had to do was put in an eye drop in each eye uh, at night and go see my doctor every three to four months. So I was moving along just fine. And then when I was 28 years old at another milestone in my life, when I was just finishing up my medical training um, and about to uh, become a full-fledged doctor, I got the news that I was losing vision in my left eye. And um, I was told that I should get a trabeculectomy, which is a more invasive uh, glaucoma surgery in order to save my eyesight in the long run. And um, on top of that, you know, on the eve of that first surgery, uh, I also found out I was pregnant with my first child. So I just felt as though there was just 
all this news, this burden that was just put on me because while I was obviously very excited to have a child, um, again, it was that fear, that anxiety that set in, of, well, will I be able to take care of this child that I'm bringing into the world? Um, and then that surgery went well. And in the subsequent years, uh, despite really well-controlled eye pressures and an excellent uh, glaucoma specialist, I did continue to lose vision. Uh, glaucoma tends to affect your peripheral, your side vision first, and then uh, more and more into the central vision. So over the years, I have undergone multiple surgeries uh, in both eyes and have devices placed in them to, to control the pressures. Um, so uh, back to what Dr. Hearn had talked about earlier, I mean, I've had trabeculectomies, uh, revisions to the trabeculectomies, um, express shunts, I've had Ahmed valves, two of them in fact placed in one eye. I've had something called a laser diode uh, cyclophotocoagulation, uh, and even a corneal graft that was used to address a um, side effect from one of the Ahmed valves. So um, there are many times, you know, I, I look at my eyes and I think I have bionic eyes. I mean, I have all of these devices in there, but, but they have helped me see. And I currently have lost over 50% of vision in my left eye and I have um, a vision deficit uh, in my right uh, but overall, I, I have good central vision. So you might want to know, well, what are the effects uh, of glaucoma on me? What, what has happened over the last 26 years? Well, I would say the biggest effect glaucoma has on me is that it affected my, uh, my dreams for my future and my career path. Um, just a little personal story. I came to the United States as a boat refugee in the aftermath of the Vietnam War, and this was in um, the late 1970s. The United States gave me the resources to succeed academically, and I uh, earned a spot to study at Harvard University. Growing up, uh, I was actually exposed to doctors a lot because uh, my maternal grandfather had uh, metastatic lung cancer. And um, unfortunately, the adult family members uh, didn't speak English. So I was the translator at, at essentially all of his uh, doctor's appointments. And because of this frequent exposure to the medical field, my dream was to study at Harvard and embark on a career in medicine. Um, and I had hoped to be a surgeon. I, I actually was a hospital volunteer um, shadowing a neurosurgeon uh, throughout much of high school. But when I got that glaucoma diagnosis at age 21, uh, I really had to pivot in my career choice, or at least I felt I had to. Um, I chose another medical field that I would not require so many years of study and that I knew would allow me to work even with diminished vision. So I have been a family physician for 20 years now, and almost all of which uh, have been devoted to taking care of the underserved population, um, and currently the uh, Asian immigrant population in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I get to use my position as a doctor and as a glaucoma patient to educate my own patients about this disease. And I feel very, very lucky uh, that I'm able to do this much. Um, in terms of my day-to-day -day life on an uh, on a even more personal level, uh, glaucoma has affected me in many ways. Um, as I said before, I, I have limited peripheral vision in my left eye and um, extremely poor night vision. So I have to drive carefully. I, I still drive just out of necessity, um, but I am always cognizant of what's on my left so that I don't get into accidents. And at night, uh, the glares are very hard. Uh, the low lighting, I just it, things just don't come out in the low lighting. So um, I don't drive at night unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, and so juggling a, a career and, and three kids and parenting three kids, it, these limitations can make life pretty difficult. Um, I also can no longer uh, recognize faces as well from a, even from a relatively close distance. Uh, so I think that has to do somewhat with that contrast sensitivity that Dr. Hurden was talking about. So I have uh, inadvertently snubbed a lot of neighbors 
because I, I can't recognize their faces and I've asked them to speak up so I can recognize them through their voices. And um, I also have lost depth perception. So how that shows up is I can walk down the stairs or sometimes walk up the stairs and just miss a step and fall. And at work, I have stopped doing most of the finer procedures, uh, such as suturing. There was a span of six years in the last 26 years where I was, uh, my eyes were not doing so well and I was getting surgeries uh, essentially every year. And the recovery period for each surgery was about six weeks long. Um, and during that time, you know, you cannot see well. Um, you might have a patch over your eyes for a certain number of days. And also uh, the restriction was that you can't lift more than about five pounds or so. So my kids, I have three kids, my kids um, were infants during some of these recovery periods. And it was just really sad, I remember, not being able to, to hold them, to pick them up. And um, as my kids got older and understood more, uh, they realized what was happening to me during these surgeries, and it frightened them. Um, so, so, you know, it certainly does affect your family. Um, my patient's uh, care was also affected, you know, it was disrupted while I was away during these uh, frequent recovery periods. And I always blamed myself for uh, not being a good, diligent doctor, not being there for them. And lastly, uh, glaucoma has been quite costly uh, as a chronic disease. I, um, as Dr. Herden alluded to, you know, having commercial insurance uh, really, really helps with your care. And I, I was lucky and I am still lucky. Um, I continue to use two eye drops a day, which are quite expensive. They come in these little 2.5 milliliter vials and, and you have to be quite accurate in your eye to make that vial last for the month. Um, and I have frequent doctor's visits for monitoring and testing. And I'm grateful that I can afford my medical care because I know there are many uh, who cannot. So I don't know what the future holds for me, but I am really hopeful and I'm grateful for what I have been able to do. Um, in the last 26 years since my diagnosis, research has led to new devices and medications to control glaucoma better. And I am certain it was because of this research that is why I have maintained useful vision for so long. Um, continued and greater investment in glaucoma research will help me and others in a similar situation remain productive throughout our lives. And hopefully uh, that uh, investment in research will also offer a newly diagnosed glaucoma patient a life that is unrestricted by fear of blindness. So thank you so much for your time listening to my story. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Green. Uh, I think it's a it's an incredible uh, opportunity to to understand um, you know your experience and, and really appreciate you sharing your experience with us. Uh, I think it's also helpful to understand the, the scope of glaucoma and and uh, that it's not while it is predominantly impacting uh, older Americans, uh, it's obviously not exclusive to that uh, po older population. And so um, I, I've got our our uh, panelists joining here. Uh, everybody's back on video, uh, so I appreciate that. Um, and uh, we do have a couple of of questions uh, that have come in. Uh, we have a few that came in prior uh, to the uh, the congressional briefing today. Um, so we can start off with some of those and, and we'll make sure to address some of the ones that are uh, continuing in the chat. So please, if you have uh, any questions uh, for any of our panelists, uh, please use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen and, uh, and we'll go ahead to do our best to answer them in the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes here. Um, the first question I wanted to ask, uh, and, and Dr. Herndon, I think I'll, I'll probably just start with you really quick. Um, do we know uh, how many people uh, you know, don't get diagnosed with glaucoma, or uh, can you help us better understand some of the challenges in, in diagnosing glaucoma um, it, just from the onset? Well, the challenge is uh, definitely the main challenge is it's a symptomless uh, disease. It's been called the sneak thief of sight. Because uh, Trin may have not, I'm not w sure why she went to get her eyes checked um, at 21, but uh, likely she wasn't having symptoms because the vision loss, as she mentioned, starts in the periphery. And it's only when you start having symptoms that it's concerning because it means that you are already at pretty severe uh, visual field loss. And so that, that's the main thing. And it's been stated that about 50% of people with glaucoma don't really know they have glaucoma. 
and it could be up to 90 percent in West Africa and don't they know, don't know they have the disease because it's all about increasing awareness of uh, this uh, disease. And Trin, do you have uh, anything to add there um, just in terms of your own experience? Oh, you might be on mute. Sorry. So as uh, exactly as Dr. Herndon said, uh, it, it's asymptomatic early on. Uh, I was, you know, it was serendipity that I got diagnosed with glaucoma because I had something else called papillophlebitis, which is a rare inflammatory condition uh, of one eye. And that attracted a lot of uh, eye doctors to look at my eyes. And so that got monitored. And over time, they began to notice my pressures were going up and I was having changes with glaucoma. And, and so I was discovered early before any kind of vision loss set in. And, and obviously, uh, early, early detection is, is vital to, to the treatment. Um, in terms of, of understanding the root cause of glaucoma, how, how do we know that there's a genetic cause or component to it? Um, Dr. Herndon or, or uh, Tom or, or Dr. Green? I mean, the, the genetic component, uh, that's one of my areas of research uh, that took me to West Africa you know, 25 years ago uh, doing the genetics of research. And um, there are several genes that have been identified as being uh, related to glaucoma. But right now, there's not a, a blood test, for instance, you can go and take and see what your risk is. Hopefully, one day that will be uh, available for patients. But there's a strong familial component. And we know that's one of the greatest risk factors of glaucoma is those uh, patients who have a family history. And sometimes I'll see a patient, they may have a younger family member in the, in the room, and I'll you know take a quick look at their, their family member's nerves <laughs> just to make, make sure they're okay. But there is a strong familial component. So, yeah, I think... Uh, that's an important point to stress that if glaucoma is in your family, let your family members know, because not only is it a silent, symptomless disease, but you can't tell someone has glaucoma by looking at them and there's no behavioral indications. So it's really important that parents, grandparents, siblings, find the opportunity to encourage your family members to get screened because that's one of the highest risk factors. Yeah. Um, in terms of, of the research behind uh, advancements in glaucoma, the, the research and diagnosis, treatment therapies, and, and overall patient outcomes, um, it, Tom, maybe you can uh, give us sort of a, a, just your thoughts uh, initially on, on the importance of research and how that plays a role in, uh, in the continued development of, of treatments for this. Well, the, the research is key, really, to all the advances. And uh, Leon mentioned, I think, some of the new minimally invasive glaucoma devices. Uh, Trin mentioned some of the devices she's uh, had to use or that are, have been uh, performed, procedures that have been performed on her. Um, also, in terms of the eye drops, the eye drops today are totally different than what doctors had even 30 years ago. Um, some excellent uh, new drugs. And all of that comes strictly through research. And of course, Leon should comment really about Duke because uh, David Epstein there had a huge um, impact with uh, the development of one of the key drugs. Maybe you could uh, make a comment. That was a long research effort, which brought a very important new drug to the market. Yeah, another David Epstein, not the one on the call here, but uh, my past chairman, David Epstein, who for years was trying to find a new new medication that would increase the outflow of the aqueous through the drain of the eye, uh, uh, call it trabecular diuretic, if you will. And through his efforts, uh, there was a spinoff of uh, Duke University Eye Center to a company called Airy Pharmaceuticals. And that brought the first new class of medications for glaucoma in 20 years, uh, the rokinase inhibitors. Uh, to the market. Those are very powerful medications, and uh, we're certainly indebted to certainly research and Dr. Epstein's efforts uh, 30, starting 30, 40 years ago. And I would just say also the National Eye Institute drives that research and is hugely important, um, and there's a major uh, effort there on uh, restoring vision. So people like Trin who have actually lost vision might potentially be able to get their vision back. And this has been a dream 
But today there is some very promising work on that and, and mostly funded really by the National Eye Institute. Absolutely. And, and, and that goes right along with uh, the, the Alliance for Eye and Vision Researchers, yeah. uh, you know, it, it, it focus on research saving sight restoring vision. It, it is both and the research can help drive that. Uh, and NIH has been and a global leader in that. So I'm uh, really excited about that uh, and that prospect. Um, in terms of, of uh, disparities, we learned a lot about some of the disparities out there uh, with glaucoma specifically. How might AI or, or research broadly help with some of the disparities and, and addressing some of those disparities? Um, and as a follow-up, uh, I know there's a, a question in the, the chat here about uh, access to, to some of the care. Um, we can kind of follow up on that, but, but just in terms of uh, addressing disparities in, in AI and research, um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm not an expert on artificial intelligence. Uh, we do have a colleague, one of my colleagues here, Duke Felipe Baderas, is one of the world's experts in this area. Um, but the thing about uh, AI, I mean, there's um, it could potentially help with um, with algorithms. Algorithms can be calibrated to ensure equity, and so that's an exciting area of research that takes bias off the table, hopefully. And uh, but uh, we'll hope to to allow better diagnosis uh, in the future. Yeah, I would just add to that that um, you know the COVID situation showed us how we can take um, healthcare to the patient when the patient can't come to the doctor. And, and we had a whole session at our, we, we have a meeting, Glaucoma 360, where we bring together the innovative new ideas, the, the physicians, the patients, and the companies that, that eventually bring these products to the, to the market so, so that they can be used clinically. And telehealth and telemedicine um, is a huge, I think, leveling um, to use your <laughs> that cartoon. You know, it, it, th those two crates that that little short guy was standing on. If we can bring the healthcare to the patient, who doesn't have who doesn't have one of these? Whoops, you can't see it. You know, and you can take a fundus photograph with your iPhone now and diagnose diabetic retinopathy. And as Felipe has spoken, there'll be a point where you may be able to do that with glaucoma as well. So instead of having to have a doctor look at the pictures that Leon showed, it may be possible for a, an algorithm, a, 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 you know, essentially a smart program to identify those changes in the optic disc. And if we can just see those people. So I think we have to get to the patients and do more outreach and not just in Africa, but here in the U.S. as well. So there, there are plenty of places and there are good examples of ophthalmologists in Canada working with remote populations, uh, using telemedicine to bring care to them so they don't have to drive hundreds of miles to get an eye exam. And uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there to level the field. And I think that that, that brings up, you know, the, this question around access and, and equity of access. Um, and, and Dr. Herndon, there's a, a question in the, the chat here uh, from Kira just around um, the equity of access to, to MIGs and, and whether or not individuals have public insurance versus private insurance. Um, you know, e equal access to procedures, is that a challenge right now in terms of coverage and, and care? Yeah, equal access is a, a challenge. <laughs> Similar to the article I uh, referenced, Dr. Elam's group in Michigan, where they looked at just diagnostic uh, parameters and public versus uh, private insurers. Uh, we, we, I don't know specifically, there one, I haven't seen a data that's looked at MIGs, but I clearly think that there's gotta be some, some inequity there. And, and I think she also, the question was also asked, can we intervene earlier in patients' glaucoma process with, with these MIGs? And that, that's where we're headed. Uh, those two devices that I mentioned, the hydrogen and Isten, had to be combined with cataract surgery. But there are some uh, other mix, minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries that can be performed much earlier and without a standalone, without a, uh, intervening cataract surgery at the same time. So, so I think we can get patients in the system sooner and treat them earlier, get them off medications if possible, decrease their medication burden. Uh, starting early, as Dr. Green has mentioned, is really the key. 
Excellent. Uh, and Dr. Green, uh, actually, you know, that's a, a great point. You know, we were kind of wrapping up the session here, uh, coming up on the hour. Um, if you can provide any any guidance or any insight into sort of the, the biggest impact uh, that it's that, that glaucoma has, has had on your life and um, and what you want to leave uh, folks here understanding about glaucoma and about the continued need for research. Could you kind of speak to that uh, just briefly? Uh, <clears throat> yes, sorry. Um, I would I would definitely say that um, some of the points we talked about earlier, gl glaucoma, especially early on, is asymptomatic. So get yourself checked, especially if there is uh, any family history. But also just understand that the, the trajectory of glaucoma is different for everybody. And to stay hopeful, you know, don't just assume that blindness is the ultimate <clears throat> uh, end result. Um, and yes, if we can continue to invest in research, we will come up with better devices, better medications that we can use sooner on a diagnosed patient to preserve their sight as much as possible and, and lead to a productive life. Excellent. Uh, well, you know, again, I, I really want to thank all of our uh, panelists here today. Uh, your your expert and your guidance and, and responses to these have been really helpful, I think, in understanding glaucoma better. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending today's briefing to celebrate World Glaucoma Week with, uh, with AVER, with the Alliance for Eye and Vision Research. Um, again, this briefing will be available in the coming days uh, on the AVER website at iresearch.org and on ARVO's website at arvo.org. Um, again, uh, Dr. Leon Herndon, Tom Bruner, and Dr. Trent Green. Um, I also want to thank again our supporters for today's briefing, including Research Prevent Blindness, uh, the, the American Glaucoma Society, the Glaucoma Research Foundation, uh, and the Optometric Glaucoma Society. Uh, and I also want to extend a, a thanks to, again, Arvo for uh, providing streaming support uh, and to Glaucos uh, for providing event support for today's event. So uh, with that, uh, we'll close it out. And uh, thank you again. And I hope you all have a great afternoon.